This is the Private Officer Beat Radio with Rick McCann at the microphone. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of the Private Officer Beat Radio. It's it's August, and it feels like August in most of the places that I've gone to over the last couple of weeks until it didn't. I was in the uh, the mountains of Virginia and D.C. Uh, well, they're not the mountains, of course, but I was in the D.C. and Virginia area and Maryland doing some training last week. And it was really kind of strange. I was driving along the interstate, 81, and I had just come from the office in Charlotte, North Carolina, where the temperature was 92. But by the time that I reached the mountains of Virginia along Interstate 81, coming up through the Blue Ridge, uh, there had been a, 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 a short, I, I don't even want to say a, a rainstorm. It was more like a, a rain shower, but there had been a short, window of rain that came through and I could still tell that the ground was wet and also off in the distance uh, over the mountain the skies were still cloudy and dark so I knew it had been raining and the temperature because of that rain had dropped down to 73 degrees almost a 20 degree difference in uh, just a, a short amount of time really it was uh although i'd seen it numerous times in this area before i have come through during the month of october and november and having left either charlotte or uh, northern virginia and coming back through the blue ridge mountains the weather is always colder there or cooler and oftentimes you're leaving someplace where it's cool but clear and you wind up driving through this mountain range and it's raining or in the cooler months the colder months um, you have a good likelihood of meeting some snow showers uh, ice on the roads and varying climate weather and strong winds lots of strong winds you get cross winds in this area so uh, on this trip that kind of happened the temperatures dropped just like that and guess what else i just noticed i just uh was reading that there are three tropical disturbances or waves in the tropics and the tropics have been extremely quiet for the last month with the last storm hitting south carolina but now there are three different chances of development into a, a tropical storm of some type. And we're watching that very close. And of course, we'll be sending out information should that develop into tropical storms or even hurricanes. But you never know this time of year, all the way through, I mean, we've got quite a ways left of the hurricane season you really never know what's going to happen. So if you live along the Atlantic or the Gulf, obviously we want you to, you know, be prepared and uh, make sure that you have a weather box and that you're staying on top of and in tune with the weather way over on the other side of the world, it seems, because most tropical storms start way down in the African uh, Horn, Africa Horn area and uh, some in the Pacific start way out there. But I can tell you this, if you don't pay attention and you think, ah, there's nothing going to happen, those are the times when you're going to get caught off guard. And I can tell you, a lot of people along the Gulf Coast was caught off guard two years ago when Hurricane Sally 
which was expected to be just a, a high-end tropical storm and probably land over in Louisiana, actually decided to stop by Alabama as a category high category one, even on the threshold of two, and really hammered the Gulf Coast there. And we've seen it happen time and time again. So be very careful. That's all that I want to tell you. Uh, it, it's really concerning how laxed uh, people in general can be about the weather. But if you are a history buff, if you are somebody who likes uh, the weather, if you are somebody who likes, you know, geographical stuff, then you see the changes that's happening. I don't think, uh, I, you know, maybe some of it is related to climate control, but that's for a different radio show. <laughs> but, uh, you know, things are definitely warming up. We see the temperature of the Gulf rising almost every year. And uh, we also see flooding in many areas on the East Coast in the Carolinas that has never flooded before, Virginia too. And all the way up the Eastern Seaboard, um, they were saying in New Jersey and New York, they have had flooding in places that they never had flooding just from a normal summertime uh, rainstorm. So we do have to be prepared. Well, there's a lot more happening here in the private officer beat radio and in the security business as a whole, besides the weather, of course. And we're going to bring you a lot of that information, news, and uh, a tragic event that happened a few days ago last week. We'll tell you that when we come back from our first break. I do want to remind everyone about the private officer memorial happening again this year, something we've done since we first began the association. We travel across the country from uh, sea to sea, wherever people will invite us to come in and do hold a memorial service. That's what we're going to do, and that's what we have done. A memorial service is 30 to 60 minutes of talking about the importance that private security officers play, the dangers of the job that many people do not know or realize, and uh, a roll call of officers killed in the line of duty over the last 12 months. Like I've reported many times, we've had a lot of great attendance. We've had a lot of folks from uh, everything from police chiefs and fire chiefs to uh, state and U.S. Senators, representatives, members from the governor's office, uh, the press corps, the media, and the general public have come out. And we've had some really very cool things. We've had the honor guard there a couple of times. That was really a highlight. Uh, a number of years ago in Lebanon, Tennessee, my friend Mike Thornhill, uh, now retired as uh, campus chief, at a college there in Tennessee, was able to coordinate with the police department's um, honor guard, and they came in, and that was really just super, super. We've had it one other time uh, in South Carolina, and we've had singers. Uh, we've had people give um, speeches, memorial speeches, talking about the security industry, as a whole and how it's changed over the last 50 years. And we've had a lot of great response from media. Uh, it, it took a while, it took about five or six years for them to finally come around to coming out to see what it was all about. But once one did, then others did. We've been in uh, national media. We have had attention from a lot of uh, organizations and so on and so forth. So if you would like to hold a memorial service uh, all that you really need is to have a little place with uh, about 25 chairs in it. It could be at your office, a church, um, a hotel, a school, uh, and many other places. You do have to help to uh, coordinate it, sponsor it financially with a little finance. Um, and if you can't, that's all right. We'll, we'll raise funds other ways. To get more information, please contact Help Desk at privateofficer.com. When I come back, I want to talk about a very tragic, 
tragic, tragic situation that occurred this past week in Washington, D.C. It is something that has occurred before, but it's been a while. And when I heard about it, um, it, it was shocking. It really was. You're listening to the Private Officer Beat Radio. We'll be right back. From coast to coast, cops are cracking down on seatbelt violations. Buckle up day and night or expect a ticket. It doesn't matter who you are or where you live. They'll be on the lookout. Cops write tickets to save lives. Click it for ticket. There was the explosion, and I remember just opening my eyes, and it got both of my legs. I had surgery after surgery, and what's going to happen next? The Wounded Warrior Project said, look, brother, everything's going to be okay. Three months from now, four months from now, a year from now, you'll be fine. I don't know if I would be as well adjusted as I am now if it wasn't for them. To learn more, call 1-877-832-6997 or visit WoundedWarriorProject.org. Tornadoes are nature's most violent storms. Spawned from powerful thunderstorms, tornadoes can flatten a neighborhood in minutes. If a tornado warning were issued, what would you do? Where would you go? The time to prepare is now. Put together a family emergency plan. Discuss with your family how to get to a safe place, how to communicate with one another, and where to meet up after the event is over. Identify an out-of-state family member or friend to act as the family contact. Free resources are available from ready.gov. Put together a basic emergency supply kit. It should include a three-day supply of non-perishable foods and water, one gallon per person per day, a first aid kit, portable radio, flashlights and batteries, medications and other essential items. You might also include cash, a helmet, IDs, and a spare set of keys. Find out where local shelters are and the fastest way to get there. Purchase a NOAA weather radio. It will broadcast tornado watches and warnings. You can also receive wireless emergency alerts on your cell phone. Make sure your wireless notification setting is turned on. Practice periodic drills so that you and your family members know what to do if a tornado warning is issued. Safety is job number one. Get weather ready. We do have some breaking news this morning coming out of New Morgan, Pennsylvania. That's in Berks County. A security officer has been killed, another one wounded during a shooting at a business. Police say that it occurred overnight Saturday into early Sunday in the 200 block of Quarry Road. According to Burst County District Attorney John Adams, the security officers were providing security for Morgan Corporation, a manufacturer of truck bodies. Authorities say that a suspicious vehicle was seen in the area, and they believe security officers approached the vehicle and were met automatically with gunfire. The 37-year-old security officer who died has not been identified. The other security officer wounded also has not been identified, but has since been released from the hospital. Authorities don't know if the vehicle was involved in a theft or some other criminal activity or why they opened fire on the security officers when they approached the vehicle. This is an ongoing investigation and we will keep you updated as information comes into our office. My name is Melissa Kinsey and I'm with the YMCA of Lincoln. Drowning can happen in an instant. Your kids need to be safe not only in the swimming pool, but at the lake and even in the bathtub. So what you can do to keep your kids safe is to supervise them. 
Put down the phone, put down the book, and sit and watch. Sit and play. Put your swimming suit on and make sure that your kids are always in view and they will have a great summer. Thoughts of suicide may feel impossible to overcome, but with help and support, you can find hope and meaning. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK to speak to a counselor or visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. It's free, it's confidential, it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And even if it feels like it, you're not alone. Welcome back. This is the Private Officer Beat Radio, a production of Blue Ram Media Group and Private Officer International, a private security and law enforcement organization for just about 20 years now. And we are excited and proud to say that because many companies and businesses don't stay around that long. They don't survive. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We are going to be presenting a free seminar to our private officer members about business. Now, we about two years ago, we've done something similar. We presented um, a training through our radio program about uh, how to start a private security company. But this is going to be a little bit more. It's going to be talking more about being an entrepreneur and business in general. And that will be available uh, next month, September. And like I said, if you're a member, a private officer, it's going to be completely free. If you're not, it'll be just 99 bucks. I think that's pretty fair. I think that uh, in the private security field right now, we have a lot of people uh, I had a conversation last week, two conversations, actually, one during a training segment that I was doing and one on the phone from someone that I don't even know who wanted to talk. But uh, right now in private security, we have, we're kind of at a crossroads, and we have been at quite for quite a while. But this gentleman was telling me that he got into the business to help others. He was at the crossroads. He was thinking about going into law enforcement, and this was a few years back, five or more, before um, the riots and the defund the police, although we've heard that through the years. And then he looked at the private side, and, and it really wasn't about money, he said, for him, but rather he thought he could help more people. He could offer his security services to churches and low-income apartments to keep them safe and charge um, a lower rate than maybe he could get at um, a larger company or, uh, you know, uh, some large school or whatever. And he said, I, my primary goal for doing this was to make a living doing something I love to do to provide a service that everybody needs, every business, church, school. You know, right now, everybody is asking for security, politicians included. And he said, you know, really, I was doing this. I mean, it was kind of noble, a noble thought. He said, I, I made the decision not to go into law enforcement. But now, even with everything that's happening in law enforcement, I kind of regret going into private security. And as we chatted, I said, I, I understand that. I feel what's happening. I own security businesses. I understand I'm in law enforcement. I understand because I hear from people all the time through POI and through my contacts in this industry what is happening elsewhere. And it doesn't matter if you live in Hawaii, Florida, California, Alaska, Connecticut, it, it doesn't matter these days. Security is experiencing the same thing. In fact, I've said this a thousand times, so please excuse me for saying it 1,001, but I read a lot every day, 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of news articles. I scan through them early in the morning when I first get up between 4 and 5 a.m., and even late at night again before I hit the, the sack. But even in other countries, Australia and the U.K. are having the same issues. I was reading an article the other day from Africa, and they have a large security presence there. Malaysia, I was reading about. Uh, all these countries and security officers are feeling the same thing, the same low pay, the same increase of assaults, shootings, homicides, being killed in the line of duty. Um, hospital security and medical personnel are really under attack these days. You know, patients coming in with all sorts of mental health problems, uh, drug crisis, and, and uh, being under the influence of who knows what, and then because they don't like what the doctor or nurse says, they attack them. Private security being hired in places where law enforcement normally would be, but because they don't have the staffing. I have a whole uh, folder online in my mailbox of all the police departments in the last three years that have deleted, deleted, deleted services that the police will provide. And who's picking up those services? Security companies. And I've got another folder that is for that. What security companies are picking up? What type of accounts? What type of services are now being uh, offered through private security? Everything from uh, protecting correction facilities to providing private policing to escorting mental uh, health patients really prisoners, they're, they're not under arrest, but they are in custody. Uh, they transport them to the mental health facilities instead of the sheriff. Uh, every place you look, security, the boundary of what security was intended to do has been pushed. And although I say intended to do, the fact is, as I have reiterated on my program and elsewhere many times, truthfully, Pinkerton and a couple of the other agency that really started the contract security business rolling in the U.S., they offered quasi-law enforcement. And in fact, Pinkerton worked to protect government officials, including the president. And in many countries, private security through legislation have the same authority as law enforcement. Canada and the U.K. use what's called special constable status to give private security law enforcement status on their properties where they are employed or are contracted to be, much like many states now in the U.S. So as we are looking, we're looking at everything that's happening in security. And while there is great opportunities, while there is a great, great uh, horizon ahead of the industry, I just don't see the owners of businesses or the industry as a whole coming together and saying, this is best practice, this is our policies and procedures, this is what we're going to do across the board, this is how we're going to handle training, this is how we're going to handle licensing, this is how we're going to handle supervision, we're going to get our act together collectively so that we can be a stronger force multiplier. And it doesn't matter which company gets the contract because we're all going to do it the same way, much like a franchise. A franchise is just that. It's a cookie cutter system where every franchise, it doesn't matter if you walk into McDonald's in New England or in Japan. They're going to prepare the food the same way. They're going to have the same condiments. They're going to do it in the same uh, time frame. They're going to do it by the numbers. Chick-fil-A is well-known. Go to YouTube. Well-known for their training programs. 
well known for their processes. In fact, they tell the franchisee before even they sign any agreement or take any money, you're going to do it our way or no way because our way is successful. Look around. Every place you go now, Chick-fil-A's are there, and they're sprouting up everywhere like wild weeds. When you have a system in place, when everyone's kind of on the same page, one mind, one accord, when you're doing it the right way, especially in our industry, you're not only going to be more profitable as a business, but you're going to be really, truly protecting people instead of just supplying a body. And so talking to this gentleman who owns the business, he says, I'm, I'm going to close up. I've had it. I'm just... You know, uh, the contracts that I do have, I can't staff anymore. If I do staff them, they want double of what we paid just two years ago. Uh, my competitors always, always underbid, and then they can't provide the service. Uh, it's a constant turnover for them, revolving doors, just like it always has been in this business. And before we get into the conversation, I mean, I was almost like in tears because he was right, and a lot of small companies who I think really could grow and understand really what the business is all about, instead are closing their doors. And and they had no options. And uh, so before we ended the call, one of the things he said really stuck out to me, and that is, that security, and this is something I've said many times, is a staffing agency. The word security, if you really look up that definition and take it to heart, in many cases, is not even part of the equation of the business. And sadly, what clients are getting is someone, if they do come to work at all, uh, who's just there to pass time and collect a little bit of money. There are many others, and this is where the rubber meets the road. There are many others who do the job exactly how it's supposed to be done, but like he said, and he's one of those companies, by the way, but like he said, they get the raw end of the deal because they're doing it as it's supposed to be done, and they're called cop wannabes, or the client drops the account because they pay, they're pay they paying too much. Somebody else came in and said, we'll do it for $2 plus an hour. I don't know how, because especially during this day and age, you cannot hire people anymore, number one. And number two, when you do hire people, they want you know ungodly amounts of money, even if they have no training, no experience. I just saw, and this is in my area, I just saw a, a North Carolina chain, fast food chain, a national chain, who at one time they had a, a poster up in the window that said, come in, we're paying $16 an hour. Well, just this weekend I saw the poster said, come on in, we're paying you $21 an hour. Fast food. I was on the phone today, just before I went to the radio show, talking to a property manager. And she said, we had a security company in here, and we were paying them X, Y, Z. And, yeah, it was kind of on the low end, but they were satisfied with it for a number of years. Well, they recently came to me, and they said, just in the past week or so, we're going to have to almost triple that amount. Triple that amount because we have to pay our security officers almost triple what we did just two years ago or a year ago even. And that's what's going on in the industry. There's a lot of opportunities in this business. And if you really want to be professional, if you really want to have something in between security and law enforcement, somewhere in the middle, the opportunity is there now, where maybe it wasn't five years ago. It is there because that's what a lot of companies want, but not every company. A lot of clients just want, unfortunately, a person that's on the property. I think I, I I don't know really. I think that we're um, 
we're at the place where you're going to have bodies and then you're going to have really high-end professional law enforcement, quasi-law enforcement um, companies, agencies, and there's not going to be much in between. I will tell you that um, in the last three or four months that I've seen cities and towns hiring more private security to take over um, the park ranger position, to take over the community service officer position, to take over crime scene protection. And this is something that's happened for many years in other countries. It's just now kind of making its way through the U.S. because there's a lack of law enforcement. The bottom line, lots of opportunities here. But we have to really step up to the plate and become more professional. And I think that we can do it. When I come back, I want to talk about a really sad situation. I was going to talk about it now, but I got off on the other subject, on a, on a tangent, on my soapbox. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, when I come back, we're going to talk about a very sad, tragic training um, event that led up to a death. You're listening to the Private Officer Beat Radio. We'll be right back. America isn't the land of promise. It's a place where every day is a struggle. Because today in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. For these children, living in poverty means going without. Going without medicine, going without food, going without a warm home, or even a roof over your head. And that's life for nearly 13 million children of all races all across America. Where will you draw the line and get involved? You can help these children and their families find a way out of poverty for good. And you can make a difference in more ways than you think. Will you help? Go to PovertyUSA.org today. Because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. Hey everyone, you're listening to the voice of the Frontline Protector right here on the Private Officer Radio Network. Now, don't go away, because we are coming right back when we've got a whole lot more right here on the Private Officer Beat Radio. If you're not already receiving breaking news and our bi-weekly newsletter, Officer Down Reports, and discount training news, in your personal or business email, then go to our website right now at privateofficer.org, privateofficer.org. A drop box will come down. Just fill out your info, and you'll be the first, one of the first, for sure, to know about what's happening in the security industry. You'll know when a security officer is killed. You'll also get these great discounts on training and equipment and so much more. Privateofficer.org. And if you're not already a member of the Private Officer International Association, sign up while you're there today. Become a lifetime member for just $99 and... We'll also include a free Private Officer International patch and lapel pin. Are you looking for the finest private security officer training in the Charlotte metropolitan area? Do you need PPS qualifications in armed or unarmed training? Or maybe 
you're over there across the line in South Carolina and you need the sled training. Well, we've got the right training at the right time for you. Premier Training Academy, located at 5624 Executive Center Drive, Suite 142 in Metropolitan Charlotte, North Carolina. Give them a call today, 704-806-4933. They also offer firearms training, personal protection, first aid and CPR, and so much more. Call John at 704 806-4933. I received some very tragic news a few days ago. And when I heard about it, and then read the news articles and a news release from the Washington, D.C. police. I was kind of confused, I was sad, and I was angry all at the same time. Special Police Officer Marisha Mannion, who was a police officer for the District of Columbia Public Library, the Office of Public Safety, a sworn law enforcement officer for the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., 25 years old, was killed in the library, in one of the city's libraries. And at first I thought, that's tragic, thinking that something happened But then I read the rest of the news release, and it said it was an accidental shooting during a training being provided in a training room in the Anacostia Neighborhood Library. And as I read that information a little bit more, It said it was actually a baton training that was happening at the library. There were several officers who were undergoing baton training when a contracted instructor who is a retired police lieutenant from another agency, not D.C., inadvertently shot her during a demonstration. What this tells me very clearly, without even being there, without looking at any pictures, video, I know exactly what occurred, because this is not the first time. In the last five years, we've had at least three or four that I can remember similar situations, including a police instructor instructing a citizen's police academy who accidentally shot and killed a 62- or 4-year-old woman taking part of a citizen's police academy. A security uh, officer was shot and killed two and a half years ago uh, in 2020 by an instructor in a classroom. And I can almost diagram in my mind, what happened in this situation at the D.C. library. Let me read one more time. Several police officers, special police officers, these are uh, not contract, but these are in-house proprietary police officers for the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., Public Library, Office of Public Safety. Washington, D.C. is one of many states Um, that allow private police officers. And, of course, D.C. is not a state, but it's a district. This special police officer and several others are in the classroom. Picture it in your mind. This is baton training, not firearm training. 
We're not practicing drawing our weapons from our holster. We're not at the range to qualify or to re-qualify. We're in a library that has probably hundreds of people or dozens of people milling around doing what they do in the library, checking out books, returning books, reading books, and they have a training room. Many libraries do. I've used them myself. But here we have a baton training not being done by the library staff, police department members, but by somebody they contract. And what happens? During a training, probably a scenario they were going over, probably talking about lethal and less lethal options, Somehow, and I don't know because they haven't released this, but I'm going to find out this week, trust me. Somehow, a female instructor, a retired police lieutenant, probably had a firearm and pulled that firearm to demonstrate something during the training. accidentally or inadvertently is what the press release is saying, which is totally different from accidentally, inadvertently, fired her gun in that library, killing Special Police Officer Marisha Mannion. Not only is this tragic in and of itself, but here you have the public in the library. It happened at 3.30 in the afternoon. you got the public. You have staff members in the library. What do you think happened? And again, the press release didn't go into this part of it, but I bet you this is what happened. What do you think happened when that gunshot went off? With all of the active shooters, all of the active shooting incidents in recent years, and and this year's alone, what do you think happened with the public, with the staff? They ran for their life. I had no doubt. Scared to death that the next active shooting was taking place at the public library in Washington, D.C., Why did that police lieutenant, retired or not, have a loaded gun in a training room? I don't allow loaded guns in a training room. Through the years, there's been a lot of these same situations where people have been killed because an instructor brought a loaded gun. A few years ago, a police officer killed a Citizens Police Academy student thinking that it wasn't a loaded gun, but an actual training weapon. How can you be, I was going to say stupid. It, It is stupid. How can you be so malicious? How can you not make sure that your gun is secured? Unloaded, And if you're going to use a training weapon, that it's red or blue or yellow or orange. Why do you think that many agencies require that you lock the gun up and make sure? In fact, uh, I was at a training last year, and, you know, I've seen this done before, but not recently. They were, like, checking for weapons. Check your partner for weapons. See if they're carrying anything. See if they left their firearm in their vehicle. See if it's locked up. I was on a university campus with other police officers, and the the campus university police chief was there. And he's like, come on, guys. You know, if you you got any weapons, let's lock them up. We don't want any accidents here. Why didn't that happen 
here. This 25-year-old will never, ever have another day to be with her family, her children, her parents. This officer was taking training to better themselves and to better protect the public. So when I read this, I was indeed sad and angry and confused when I read that this instructor was a retired police lieutenant. I have taught classes while carrying a firearm, but it was a class that we were not going to be physically engaged in any scenario type training. It was PowerPoint death class. We're doing PowerPoint and lectures no hands-on, no scenario-based, no practical, no way. How did she even think, what made her think to pull the firearm and use it in training? If you are in the Washington, D.C., Virginia, or Maryland area, There will be a funeral held this week. You can call Director of Public Safety, Douglas Morenci. His phone number, 202-727-1101. 202-727-1101. Please try to attend that memorial service or funeral. Show your support. I know that there's going to, there's over 5,000 private police in DC alone. I know that there will be a large representation of local law enforcement and private police. And if I can, I will also try to attend. I just came from there. I just came from there. But this is tragic. If you're an instructor and you're listening today, please secure the firearm before you go into class. Now, you know, I I had... Someone bring up a good point a while back. What if there's an active shooter? What if somebody comes in and starts shooting? That's not far-fetched. A few years ago in California, an instructor said something that a student didn't like. And during break, he went out to his vehicle, grabbed a gun, and came in and shot and killed the instructor. And it was a California BSIS class. So, no, it's not far-fetched that could happen. And he had a good point. What if my gun's locked up and I can't get to it? I don't, I don't know. This is a situation that should not happen. It continues to happen. We're going to take a quick break. If you have any suggestions, help desk at privateofficer.com. We'll be right back. By the Armor USA, we've got what it takes to protect you. Whether you're looking for the top quality protective armor or protective clothing, stab-resistant vests or gloves, contact my friend Ben over at Body Armor USA. Give him a call, 516 area code, 817-1666. Again, that's area code 516 817-1666. By the Armor USA, we've got what it takes to protect you. No doubt about it. I don't want to go blind from diabetes. I don't want to lose a foot or a leg. I don't want to have kidney failure, so I'm taking control. I'm controlling my diabetes. It's making a huge difference. I'm eating healthy and staying physically active. I'm taking my medicine. If I can do it, anyone can. Control your diabetes for life. Call 1-800-438-5383. 
I heard about a shooting involving a three-year-old girl over the summer. My daughter Riley's that age. There was a point when I felt that I was going to die. My parents used to always say a bullet didn't have a name on it. Someone put a bullet in the back of my 14-year-old son's head. The gun should never be an option. We're Americans. We don't have to live like this. We can all make a difference. In the United States, 88 people die by gun violence every day. We can end gun violence. Those that protect and serve us in law enforcement put their lives on the line. These law enforcement officers often work long and irregular hours in tough and dangerous conditions, run a high risk of being attacked, wounded, or even killed by the very criminals that prey on us. Every year, hundreds of law enforcement officers are killed or seriously injured in the line of duty. Blue Alert is a system that provides the means to speed the apprehension of violent criminals who kill or seriously injure local, state, or federal law enforcement officers. Find out how you can truly help those who help. That's bluealert.us. You're listening to the Private Officer Beat Radio, a production of Blue Ram Media Group and Private Officer International. And we're over at the news desk. As always, we have a lot of news to talk about, but um, we're going to lead off with several very concerning articles coming out just in the last few days. One of them out of Oxford, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit, in a lawsuit that is currently uh, going on, the lawsuit accuses an armed security officer and the school district of not stopping an active shooter incident. An armed security officer told investigators that she thought an active shooting at the Michigan high school was nothing more than a drill and that the bleeding students laying around on the ground and in the restroom was really just wearing good makeup according to an attorney suing the school district. Attorney Ben Johnson said he's asking a judge to add that security officer's name to a lawsuit that has been filed in January against Oxford Community Schools. The lawsuit also says Oxford High School's Dean of Students, two counselors, and three teachers have also been included as defendants in the case. Now, the security officer was a former law enforcement officer. Johnson said in an amended complaint that school surveillance video he recently reviewed shows, in fact, the security officer casually walking around in the hallway during the November 30th shooting at the high school just 30 miles north of Detroit. The security officer apparently, according to what she told investigators, was confused because she thought that she heard on the radio, on the two-way radio, that there was an ALICE drill happening. ALICE is an acronym for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. Johnson said that explanation makes no sense at all because there's no indication that anybody else in the school was notified that a drill was scheduled that day. Such notifications are routine as to not cause a lot of panic. But the security officer, who is a retired deputy sheriff with Oakland County Sheriff's Department, says she thought it was all just part of some drill that she wasn't informed of. The attorney says the security officer can be seen in surveillance footage opening a door to a bathroom seeing two students, one who later was killed and another seriously injured. And instead of assisting, aiding, or or helping those students, the security officer closed the door and walked away. Prosecutors have said student Ethan Crumbly entered the bathroom with a backpack and came out with a semi-automatic handgun firing at students while moving down the hallway. The four students who were killed were 16-year-old Tate Meyer, 14-year-old Hannah St. Julian, 17-year-old Madison Baldwin, and 17-year-old Justin Schilling. 
the attorney insists that had that security officer done her job, at least the death of Justin Schilling would have been prevented for sure. He wrote in the complaint that the officer also saw Tate Myers, Tate Myers' body on the floor bleeding all around, literally bleeding to death, and informed investigators she thought it was really good makeup. Timothy Mullins, an attorney now for the school district, dismisses Johnson's allegations as untrue, suggesting that not only did the security officer not believe the shooting was a drill, but suggested she act courageously. When the facts are known, he says, a single woman without backup will be shown to be going toward the shooter, Mullins insists. No backup, unaided, no cavalier, no body armor, no waiting, exposing herself in this event to near-death situations. Crumbly, the shooter, who is now 16, faces multiple counts of murder and other charges in this case. His trial is expected to begin January of next year. His parents, James and Jennifer Crumbly, are also charged, you may remember, in this case, with involuntary manslaughter, accused of failing to keep the gun used in the shooting secure at home and failing to reasonably care for their son when he showed signs of mental distress. They have both pleaded not guilty. Also, at least two other lawsuits have been filed on behalf of the families of the students who died, who were injured, who or who were traumatized during this event. My own personal review of all the facts known at this time shows great negligence on the part of this retired deputy sheriff who should have known better. At the very least, if she even thought that this was a drill and she had not been notified, she should have taken some steps to verify what was going on. She had a two-way radio. She had a cell phone. Why not call the, the principal or somebody in the school office? Why not call 911 and say, hey, I'm the school security officer. We've got people bleeding, shots fired. Is there an active shooter here on the school campus? Because I haven't heard. But rather, she chose to ignore the obvious. She chose to ignore her duty. She chose to make believe nothing was happening. So not only is she civilly responsible, but I believe if these are all true and accurate facts, she needs to be charged herself in the shooting. And she can be charged in the state. And many cases have shown that where people have such a disregard, the people who are in charge of security or policing who have such a disregard for life has aided the actual shooter. And I believe that this security officer's statements, beliefs, and supposed this and supposed, no, I believe that she was extremely negative and culpable in the shooting, from all facts known at this time. It just doesn't make sense to me that an experience, and this wasn't just a rookie cop who quit the police force or who was fired. This was a retired deputy sheriff who obviously had made it through 20 years, maybe more, on the job. How in the world can she sit there, stand there, look at these people in the face and say, oh, I just thought it was a drill. I didn't take any steps. I didn't put in any effort. I didn't try to verify nothing. But, oh, it was just a misunderstanding, even though people died. I would expect a rookie to say that. I would expect a non-season security officer unarmed to be afraid and scared, run, hide, fight, you know, 
I would expect all of that. But in this scenario, this was an armed, seasoned, experienced law enforcement officer. And I really don't believe she has any defense whatsoever. And that's why the attorney for the victims want her name added to that lawsuit. And I can tell you this, if that does happen, there will definitely be a parallel investigation to see if she was also criminally responsible, which I believe she was. Coming out of Bloomington, Minnesota, this past week, for the second time in a year, a shooting occurred in the Mall of America. Now, the Mall of America has a very excellent security force, and they operate very much like a police agency, and they have excellent cooperation with the city of Bloomington police. But this was the second time in less than a year that a shooting occurred, the mall was locked down, and then eventually closed. It seems that two groups at the cash registers inside the Nike store had a conflict, and one person pulled a gun and began firing multiple shots. Nobody was hit. Nobody was injured. But the mall was placed into panic, people running every which way, as you can imagine. It doesn't take much these days to scare people when they believe that shots are being fired. Chairs dropping on the floor, doors slamming, is enough to cause mass panic. And what we have seen here in the U.S. and in other countries is when that occurs, people begin to run and stumble and fall on top of each other, causing great injuries and deaths. Police have nobody in custody. They said that the group showed a massive amount of lack of respect for human life. Well, that was obvious, Chief. I think we we know that because of gunfire. But they have nobody in custody. The mall has since reopened. Neither the mall nor the police chief has any solution for preventing the future acts of violence like what occurred on Thursday. That mall is huge, multiple stories, Um, There have been a lot of various incidents there over the years, a number of shootings. But like I said, they do have a very experienced professional and large internal security force. And they also have law enforcement um, on the premise as well. However, many malls have gone to hiring or buying uh, dogs to sniff out firearms Um, bullets, explosives, gunpowder, is that the answer? Right now, they're asking, are metal detectors the answer? I say yes. There are a lot of metal detectors that they're not invasive. They just sit there and they monitor those coming through the doors and trigger an alarm. Unfortunately, many people who are civilized and legally carry firearms and who are excellent uh, citizens and, and no problem whatsoever get caught up in the net. And so their Second Amendment rights are taken away because this is private property. And that's where the rub comes in. Unfortunately, the good guys... They become the bad guys, and the bad guys become the good guys. Just recently, within the last few weeks, 22-year-old at another mall was able to open fire and kill an active shooter from 40 feet away. It is unfortunate that thugs, street gangs, people who don't value life, have no common sense. It's a scary world out there, as you know. 
In Chicago, Illinois, a security officer was attacked Friday at the Jewel Osco. That's a grocery store, a, a large, similar to Walmart store. The security officer was attacked numerous times with a hammer. He has uh, been hospitalized, condition unknown. Police have nobody in custody. In Portland, Oregon, last week, a security officer uh, fired around and shot a man who was involved in uh, a verbal argument not on the property where the security officer was hired to protect. At a nightclub, he crossed the street where he saw something going on and, and inserted himself into that situation. Two men were shot. Police are investigating no charges yet. But a lawsuit has already been filed, alleging negligence, assault, and battery by the security officer who has been identified as Joshua D. Manny, 32. He was a licensed unarmed security officer, but he was carrying a firearm that night. And like I said, this whole scenario didn't even play out on the property where he was hired. He crossed the street and inserted himself into something else that he saw going on. Police say that he actually caused a bigger risk, a bigger problem, and that's when he drew uh, one person there, drew his gun, and then the security officer also drew his gun. It looks like a situation of self-defense, but that would never have happened, never, if the security officer hadn't left his post, his property, and went across the street. In Madison County, North Carolina, school officials and law enforcement say that they have reached an agreement to put AR-15s in every school. They're going to put them in emergency safes so that if there's a shooting there, that school resource officers, security officers, and others trained can have immediate access to these AR-15s. A Chicago security officer who was shot, along with several other people in University Village, is asking why the man has not been arrested. He's been charged with other things, but not the shooting of the security officer. The security officer is now out of the hospital, but he wants answers as to why the shooter has not been prosecuted. Sad and tragic, Gardena, California, one security officer is in critical condition, one newspaper said near death. A second security officer was shot during an armored car holdup at the Hustler Casino about 15 miles south of L.A. According to Gardena police, a group of suspects ambushed the two armored vehicle security officers with a rifle and multiple handguns immediately began shooting as soon as one of the security officers exited the armored vehicle. Investigators do not have any suspects in custody. However, they are uh, combing the area for video. Two more security officers apparently have died uh, and have been added to the growing list of COVID-related deaths, despite the thinking of many that COVID has run its course and is no longer a threat. The fact is, Hundreds of first responders nationwide are being infected by COVID, and some are still dying. In New York, C.T. Booker died, age 77. Betty Green in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, died. And there is reports that we are still trying to verify that other security officers have died over the last few months. They just haven't been uh, reported. So we're checking to try to confirm. Later in this edition of the Private Officer Beat, we're going to be talking about security officer roles and how they are changing, not always for the best. And here's an example. In Oakland, California, Oakland Unified Security Officers forcefully removed people from the Parker Elementary School on Thursday. The confrontation with parents after they were occupying the campus for two months in protest of the school's closure. Now, 
the point that I want to make here loud and clear is security officers definitely have a right to protect the property, and they definitely have a right to detain trespassers. Why did they allow, why why did the school system allow them to stay on the campus for two months, and then why did they use security to forcefully, aggressively assault people? I have seen the video, uh, two videos. We'll talk more about that coming up at the end of this segment. A former federal law enforcement officer and military veteran, Winston Allen, who's 92, donated $100,000 of his own money to create a scholarship fund for those pursuing a career in law enforcement. He has partnered up uh, with another agency to award uh, students who want to become police officers so that they can advance their training. Each person will receive $1,700 per semester. A California burglar returns to the scene of the crime after forgetting his keys. A San Rafael, California burglar returned to the scene of the crime when he realized, whoops, I forgot my keys inside the building. San Rafael police said the burglar had forced his way into the corporate office of Johnny Donuts and stole some cash. No donuts, just cash. But then he realized when he got to his vehicle, oh, I don't have my keys. And he turned back around and made entry back into the building. Video footage catches the man who was wearing a blue University of Kentucky T-shirt, dark shorts, walk into the building for the second time. Craig Bloom, the founder of Johnny Donuts, plans to deliver a few dozen donuts to San Rafael police officers who came to our aid to ensure that we can continue serving our community handcrafted Donuts without interruption. The donut chain operates several locations of food trucks in the San Francisco Bay Area using locally sourced ingredients to make their products. We sent out a notice. If you're on the mailing list, you probably received this. If not, you can go to our website at privateofficer.org. A box will drop down automatically, and you can fill out your information to receive breaking news reports, officer down reports, and occasional reports or offers of training and other discounts. But Special Police Officer Marisha Mannon, we mentioned this earlier, was shot and killed, sadly, during a training session, and she was 25. We have a lot of breaking news. You can always read our breaking news at privateofficerbreakingnews.blogspot.com. Read it 24 hours a day. It's always new, always fresh. Coming out of Chicago, Illinois, an 18-year-old security officer remains behind bars today after faking a mass shooting alert at Lollapalooza so that she could leave work early. Jana B. Williams sent a message via her text now number to a witness telephone, which said, mass shooting at 4 p.m. location Lollapalooza. We have 150 targets, according to prosecutors, during Williams' bond hearing. The witness immediately told her supervisor, setting off a chain of alerts to Chicago police and the FBI and Joint Counterterrorism Task Force. They quickly was able to trace the number back. They went to question her, and she admitted, I just wanted to go home early. She's been charged with state and federal offenses. She's being held on $50,000. A security officer has been charged in North Carolina with a shooting, a 19-year-old who was celebrating his birthday when his life was cut short. Some type of tiff fight uh, fray broke out at the Blind Tiger during a music, which is a music venue and I believe a bar as well, uh, maybe not. Um, and according to uh, what we know, uh, a fight broke out, an armed security officer uh, tried to break it up and um, was assaulted. He took out his weapon and began pointing it. He shot and killed this 19-year-old. He has been charged with second-degree murder. I mentioned this about a month ago, maybe a little bit longer, but this is going to be standard, it looks like, across the board in many areas. Desperate for recruits, police begin hiring non-U.S. citizens. In Albuquerque and other cities, they have begun reaching out to folks who are here without 
a work visa or a green card, encouraging them to come forward and get that green card or at least begin the process in some cases According to this, earlier this year, the California State Senate passed a proposal that would remove the provision that requires peace officers to be a citizen of the U.S. or a permanent resident. This California bill, SB 960, which has moved on to the Assembly, awaits a vote that is likely to pass and could apply to recipients of DACA the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. These are people who are not legally here, but they could soon become police officers enforcing the law. How do we know that they're not part of some gang in El Salvador or Colombia or, you know, Russia, for all we know? According to the news releases and the news media stories that have followed in recent weeks, agencies say that all of the applicants will still have to go through the background, even though some say that they have lowered some of the professional, personal, and physical standards. The regular battery of pre-screening interviews and background investigations will still be rigorous, according to one department. We'll see. It doesn't make sense to me. I know that we need police officers. I know that we're short-staffed. I know that it's hard to recruit right now. But that's like saying we're going to go to China. We're going to go recruit out of Russia. We're going to go to some of our worst enemies across the country, across the world, and we're going to hire their people to come over and be cops. Security officers keep shooting. Two more have been charged and arrested for murder. Security officers involved in multiple shootings across the country often find themselves on the wrong side of the law. In the past seven days, security officers have shot 23 people, resulting in the arrest of two security officers for murder. A third is currently under investigation. We do have an update. Now five security officers have been charged with manslaughter or murder. Still, that other one who uh, also is under investigation is still out on the limb and waiting. One of those involved the shooting uh, that I told you about a moment ago. There were more than 137 shootings involving private security in July. In Raleigh, North Carolina, a shoplifter who ran from the Crabtree Valley Mall had to be rescued after he jumped into a creek near the mall, on the side of the mall, and then swift water began taking him down the canal and He was afraid of going under. He screamed for help. Uh, Someone called 911. Police was already on the way. Rescue, fire, EMS, all had to go in and initiate a water rescue. The man has been arrested. A San Diego bar nightclub uh, security guard slash bouncer is arrested last week. He's charged with stabbing somebody, according to San Diego police had happened at the Tavola Bar and Grill, located at 505 6th Avenue. After a dispute, the security officer stabbed the man in the neck. Breaking news, 24 hours a day, Green Tree in security officer in Victorville, California, has been arrested, and he has been charged with murder in a shooting that happened earlier this year, April 1st, 2022. Authorities say that he shot and killed a man who was not armed and did not pose <clears throat> did not pose a threat. Syracuse, New York, the regional airport there will create and maintain its own police force, according to the Syracuse Regional Airport Authority. They currently have uh, police from the local area at the airport, but they want to have their own police department. The governor has signed off on it. The Syracuse police currently is still responsible for public safety at the airport. However, they will soon begin interviewing and hiring officers for their new airport police. We're seeing this. We're seeing this a lot all over the place. Many schools, uh, colleges and universities and corporations, what they're doing is they're starting their own police force if it is allowed under the law 
If not, they work with their uh, legislators to have a, a bill offered in uh, a session, and hopefully it gets passed and they can go on and cre create their own police force. John Hopkins, a very well-known large uh, college and medical center in Baltimore, recently created their own police force after a number of years of protests and stalling and people not wanting uh, more police in the city, but being a very large campus that covers uh, blocks and blocks and, and some of their property aren't even all collectively together in the same location. Uh, the law uh, that allows private schools to have police officer was already on the books and therefore they now have their own police force. We're going to take a quick break. When I come back, I want to talk about hands-on, hands-off. You know, we've heard about this observe and report model, supposedly, but I don't think it really exists much anymore. And we'll be right back on the Private Officer Beat Radio. You don't know what it's like until you're a parent. Letting go. Because we used to protect her. But now with the smart pepper spray from Sabre, we can feel a little better knowing that if something happens, she can protect herself. Not only is it the number one pepper spray brand, it also has smart features to connect us instantly when it matters most. The smart pepper spray connects via Bluetooth to the free Sabre personal safety app. With her selected contacts loaded into the app, we receive an alert if and when the pepper spray is deployed. Even better, the alert links to a map where we can geotrack her exact location to make sure she gets to safety. We also opted into the Sabre Premium Monitoring Service to make sure that if needed, local police will be alerted and given the ability to track and help her. That's all built on top of Sabre's maximum strength formula for maximum stopping power with a 10-foot range and 25 bursts per canister. So, if she's ever in a dangerous situation... We'll know. Is everything okay? I'm fine. I just got scared, but I'm fine. Oh, thank goodness. Because when you're a dad... When you're mom... Knowing that your daughter, your loved ones are safe... That's, that's everything. everything. Slow down. Slow down and move over. And move over. When you see lights, masks, I'll be flaggers. Please, give us some room. Slow down and move over. When you need us, we've got your back. You have ours. You got our back? You got ours? You got our back? Please, slow down. And move over. What a fantastic day. What a fantastic day. The water's like glass. The water is like glass. Don't forget the soda. Don't forget the life jacket. Who wants the 8 and who wants the 15? Who wants the inflatables? What a great day. To be on the water. So glad you saw me go over. That was so funny when you went over and your life jacket inflated. Never go out without a life jacket on again. What a great day we had. When it comes to wearing life jackets, make the right choice. You're in command. Vote responsibly. This message brought to you by the National State Voting Council and the U.S. Coast Guard. Remember when security's model was observe and report? Because that reduced liability and the risk of their officers being injured or their company being sued. But as you're about to hear in this audio bite, many security companies have pushed that aside as they have been contracted to be more hands-on 
and more aggressive. Across the country in recent years, security companies have begun feeling the pain because they're paying out after lawsuits or settlements for excessive force where their officers have been involved in unreasonable force and sometimes even deadly force that wasn't warranted. If you read our social media sites or get our newsletters in your email, then you see regularly, almost weekly, security involved in a gun battle, oftentimes shooting and killing a person. Is it a legit shooting? Is this a bad shooting? Nonetheless, doesn't really matter one way or the other. The point is that they're getting involved in all of these use of force situations where they really didn't get too involved just a few years back. However, as I often mention, with the less number of police, with the more increase of use of security and the higher increase of armed security, because many clients are asking specifically for armed security, and some security companies only offer armed security. They don't have unarmed. We're seeing more and more incidents of use of force. Now, in the last few years, as civil protests continue to increase across the country, every time someone doesn't agree with a decision made by somebody, whether it be a local politician, a police incident, or something else on a national scale, people are not able to settle their differences in a civil manner. They're using force, rioting, not protesting, not a peaceful march. They're using force. Some of them are going in and occupying university offices, government buildings. They're having sit-ins, as you will hear on this audio bite that I'm about to play. So what do they do? What, what does security do in these situations? They're kind of in the middle of a rock and a hard place. You have to decide whether or not any force is warranted, first of all. You have to make an assessment. You have to size it up. You have to make a decision. But unfortunately, a lot of security people, they haven't been trained to do this properly, or not at all. And they don't know what to do other than to follow instructions. So if their employer or the client says, hey, move them out, force them out of the building, throw them the heck out of here, like an old bouncer from the wild, wild west. You pick them up by their collar and their butt, and you just toss them out the door. Well, I got news for you. In today's world, that's an assault, maybe even a felony if they're injured. So what we're seeing is security trying to do the job without the training, without the legal knowledge, without their own research of the legal law that gives them a limited amount of authority to forcefully remove someone, what are they to do? Hands on or hands off? How many times do I preach that force can only be used to protect yourself or others? Or if you have the legal right to detain or make a citizen's arrest or a private person or a private police officer arrest, then you can use reasonable force to put that person into custody if they're, you know, refusing or resisting. Let's take a listen, because this, these different situations were not reasonable. <laughs> Do 
just allow your security to do that? What are you doing? Thousands of schools around. Dramatic video after a school staff member is caught on camera pinning a student down with his knee. The teen in this video talking to us saying he is traumatized. And local tennis reporter Trent Kelly joins us live this midday. And I know you're right outside that middle school in El Portel with reaction today. Well, Christy, according to students here, that uh, worker was a security guard here at Horace Mann Middle School. The student at the center of all of this was asked to take off a hoodie, which are not allowed to be worn by students here. But when he refused, that's when he found himself pinned to the ground. Part of that confrontation captured on video. <laughs> A 14-year-old student too scared to go to school after video taken last week shows a security guard at Horace Mann Middle pinning him to the ground at first using his knee before later wrapping his hands around the teen's neck. As he got back down, he moved his knee up towards my neck and he sat on my neck for like five to six seconds. The student, who asked not to show his face, says it started when he refused to take off a hoodie, which are not allowed in class, but when he did not comply fast enough, that's when he says the guard got overly aggressive. The teen's aunt and legal guardian calling the actions seen in the video unnecessary. What's your biggest fear looking at that video? My fear is him talking my neck about knowing he has a real bad asthma problem and me having to sit there and explain to my sister that her son is no longer with us. The school district telling Local 10, quote, the behavior portrayed in this video is difficult to watch and runs contrary to the comportment that is expected of all Miami-Dade County public school employees. This individual has been removed from the school pending the outcome of the investigation. You hope. You guys, you hey! 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 Stop right there! Stop right there! Stop right there! Get down! Get on the board! Now! Freeze! Don't stay still. Stay still. Put your guys' stuff down. Put your guys' stuff down. Put your guys' stuff down now. Don't you ever walk away from us. In the last two years, we have seen, we have witnessed, we have heard, we have been told about numerous violent interactions between the general public and private security. Now, in this soundbite, several different situations were occurring. In one situation, security officers physically, forcefully, and violently removed protesters who had uh, got moved in. I, I want to say really moved in because that's what they did, into a school building that they were shutting down. They occupied it. Why wasn't the police called? Or if they were, why didn't they remove or arrest these persons? They were trespassing on school property. A school was being closed down. Some citizens decided that wasn't the best uh, answer for their community. And so they moved in and they squatted and, and they uh, trespassed and they harassed and they disturbed the school system. It was an empty building, by the way, um, when they did this. But uh, when, when security, school security moved in, they used force to physically remove them. Um, I, you know, this, this is really just, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say it's beyond the scope of private security, but they should have notified local police and they should have had them come out and assist with this. And if the people didn't leave upon their order to do so, then they should have been arrested for criminal trespass, especially if they've been living on the property protesting for several months. I, I don't understand why law enforcement didn't get involved. In a second audio, uh, in, in a, a school meeting, several people were physically taken out of their chairs by school security, by contract security, and removed from the meeting because they were allowed, because they uh, didn't 
agree with what the board, the school board was doing. This was not the only location. This has happened at numerous school board meetings throughout the country. Uh, and I'll get back with that in a minute. Another piece of audio that you heard was some security officers who were violently removing some homeless people from an encampment nearby uh, a property where they were contracted. They were not necessarily contracted for the woods that surrounded the property, probably, you know, got a lot of complaints and they decided to go up there. But the audio in itself tells a, a, a story that the homeless people were not putting up a fight. They were not resisting. In fact, I saw the video, and, and what, what happened was the security officer was like, don't walk away from me. Don't disrespect me. And he used force against several individuals. That's not a legal use of force. I'm watching the video. I saw there was no resistance, no assault committed by the homeless persons, and that this was more of a macho thing from the security officers involved. Do we have to use force from time to time? Unfortunately, we do. And it's not just from time to time. It's increasing all the time. It has increased substantially over the last five years. Just the protest, we have seen more and more armed confrontations, more and more civil unrest, more and more disobedient persons refusing to leave the property, Look at YouTube. You can find them all there. Look at what's going on in retail security. People storming the stores. Some of them, no no uh, cloth over their face, no disguise. They're going in. They're filling up bags. Security just standing there with their hands in their pocket. Can't do anything. And watching them load up on hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of merchandise and walk out. Just saw one the other day. Three women loading up on expensive brand name men's underwear. They sell for 40 bucks a package. They sell them on the line on, on Facebook and, and other places. They sell them on the internet for probably half that price and still make money. We as security need to understand what our legal rights are, what our authority is, and how much force, if any, can be used in every situation. It starts with that Assessment, you got to assess what's going on and whether or not they've assaulted us or somebody else. Are we detaining them or are we removing them from the property? Whether that be uh, a shopping center, a mall, uh, a business complex, a school, whatever it might be. If they're only trespassing, if they're only threatening you, if they're being loud and disorderly and you are just trying to remove them from the property, you have limited authority to use force. You can use minimal, reasonable force to defend yourself or others. You can use lethal force in an imminent threat situation where not only are they threatening to kick your butt or kill you, but they have the means to. You see, there's several different pieces to that law. It's not just, oh, you know, he said he's going to kill me, so I'm going to pull my gun out and kill him first. No, it doesn't work that way. Not only do you have to have that threat, verbal or physical, but you you have to have the means. He, that person has to have the means to be able to follow through with that threat. I, I don't know how we're going to resolve all of these issues of use of force. Uh, I've, I've said Several times now, just in the last month, uh, many security officers are being charged in shootings, even when the other guy had a gun as well. Just because the guy has a gun, you may not necessarily have to shoot that person. When can you shoot them if they're armed? When he, they raise that gun or when they pose a threat. If you feel that your life is in jeopardy, then you can use lethal force. But you got to make sure that... Not only uh, do they have a gun, but they're intent on using that gun against you. But I'm very concerned with the hands-on, hands-off situation. I do believe that many companies across the country, and probably around the world for that matter, send out 
mixed signals to their security staff. They don't know. You know, one moment the boss is saying, yeah, hey, hands off. Don't be touching those people. Call the cops. Let the cops deal with them. And then they have a client that says, no, I want you to get them the heck out of here. I don't care what you got to do. Move them off the property. Mixed signals. Hands on, hands off. We have to make clear to our staff when they can use force, when they should not use force, when they need to call the police back off and monitor the situation. What is happening besides security using unreasonable force is that they are escalating the force now being used by those that they're trying to use force against. So in this audio where trespassers were in the school building for up to two months on and off, different people, and the police didn't remove them, security should not have removed them. Even though they were trespassing and security is the agent of the property, they should have again called the police and said, we're ready to move them by, you know, either asking or forcing or arresting them. We need your help. And the police have to respond. It is important in this day and age when so many law enforcement officers are being prosecuted, being arrested, being indicted, that security understand that they're, they're no different. In fact, it, they're probably more likely to be arrested, indicted, prosecuted than law enforcement. If you're wearing a uniform, if you're representing uh, a client, proprietary or contract, security, public safety, or even if you're a private police officer, you have to understand limitations, hands-on, hands-off, hands-off, hands-on. Sometimes all of that can change within a few seconds or a few moments. Maybe you go hands-on. The person stops for you and says, okay, 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 I'm leaving, I'm leaving, man, I'm leaving. Then you get your hands off unless they're assaulting you. We are in a, a time right now when everything in this industry is turned upside down. And the people working in this industry really don't have a direct line of what it is that I'm supposed to do and when it is I'm supposed to do it and how far am I supposed to go with this. It's up to us to lead them, to train them, to supervise them, to show them, to uh, mentor them, to guide them. Because if, if they do something incorrectly, we, the employer, we're at fault. You're at fault. Supervisors are a fault. They could be sued. In some cases, they may even be arrested and charged criminally. We have to do a better job, as I keep saying, in this industry of training, uh, of preparing, of equipping. You know, every time that something new happens out there in law enforcement, they come up against something different or new, we should be making our people aware of this situation, whether that be the increase in fentanyl, the increase of disobedient, disorderly persons, resisting persons, uh, the, the occupying of buildings, whatever it might be. Last week, a Portland, Oregon security officer was arrested because he was working at a nightclub. He saw a disturbance across the street, down on the corner. He went across there where he has no authority, no right to be. Not only that, but he left his employer's property unsecured. And he went down there and he inserted himself. And words were exchanged, pushes were happened, and one of the people involved pulled a gun. And that's when the security officer pulled his gun and he fired and killed one man and shot another man. And it comes comes to light now that the security officer was licensed as an unarmed security officer, but not an armed security officer. So he hasn't been charged, but I'm sure that he will be indicted. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Private Officer Beat Radio. Please, ladies, gentlemen, I know you're trying to do your job, and I know it's confusing. I know that you're getting mixed signals, but take it into your own hands to get that training, to get the knowledge, to understand the law of the land in your area. Until the next time, be safe, be blessed, and we'll see you back here on the radio.